Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. Let's read in um, John chapter 1. We already read verse 11 where uh, he has said that the Jews rejected him. Verse 12, but as many as received, let me go back to 11. He came to his own, and those who were his own received him not. The Jews rejected him, okay? But, verse 12, to as many as received him. Is that only Jews? No, Jews and Gentiles. All the many are Jews and Gentiles here. To as many of the peoples in the world who received him, the Messiah, to them Jesus gave, the Messiah gave the right to become children of God, adopted in to be sons of God, just as the Jews had been, even to those who do what? Believe in his name. Believe and faith in the Bible are synonymous. It's the same Greek word. Pisteo, if it's a, it's a verb, and pistis, if it's a noun. Same word. So here it says, the people who became sons of God, all they had to do was what? Believe. Believe, have faith in the Messiah. That's what it says. And so because the Jews rejected him, it says in verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but now we have grace and truth that were realized through Jesus Christ. The Jews used the law to try and be good, but it, that's not good enough to save you. That's what Romans 4 says. Uh, and then we know from uh, Romans, that we've already read the Romans passages, so we're not going to go there. But we know the church age now, we're grafted in to those promises. But let's look at Isaiah 49.6. This is just one of the passages in Isaiah and elsewhere in Scripture that tells us this, but it's a prophesying of the old, in the Old Testament that we would be grafted in or we would be brought into the kingdom. In Isaiah 49, verse 6, Isaiah prophesies and says, uh, God says, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? Now this is a prophesying of the Messiah. He said, I will also make you a light of the whom? The nations. The Messiah was going to be a light to the Gentiles. The Gentiles and nations in the Bible are synonymous. So that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Now f flip your, your Bible hand over to Luke chapter 2. Because in Luke chapter 2, he's quoting uh, either from this passage or from chapter 42 verse 6. When Simeon prophesies when he's holding the baby Jesus... And he says, verse 30, For my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of the people Israel, of thy people Israel. So God, and then, one other place, um, Galatians chapter 3. Just so we get the full flavor of this. I love going through the Old Testament, the New Testament together, and showing you how everything just matches up. Because it's so much fun. In, um, I'm going to read Galatians 3, starting verse 6. Is that on this? Yeah, it is. It's down a little bit lower. Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That's quoted out of Genesis 15, and it's quoted several places in the New Testament. And if you catch it, Abraham did what with God? Believed. God. And that's what was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. It wasn't the law that saved him. Why? Because the law didn't come for 430 years until after Abraham. It wasn't circumcision that saved him because Romans 4 told us it wasn't. It wasn't uh, doing good works that saved him because Romans 4 said that didn't save him. But instead Romans 4 says Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. It's the same thing for you and I. Therefore, verse 7, be sure that it is those who are faith who are sons of Abraham. Not just ethnicity, not just religion. Those who are faith are sons of Abraham. And the scriptures, this is what I love, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, 
All the nations shall be blessed to you. Now, isn't that cool how God just solidifies there what we've just read today, tonight in the Old Testament? And then he tells us in verse 16, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds is referring to many, but rather to one, that is to your seed, that is the Christ. I mean, the New Testament just fulfills the Old Testament. But God says here in these passages, which is the point we're making here, is that God has brought Gentiles. He prophesied in the Old Testament that the Gentiles would be brought into his kingdom because he knew the Jews were going to reject him. He tells us in Luke that that happened when they saw Jesus. He tells us in Galatians that the gospel was preached beforehand, knowing that the Gentiles were going to be coming into the kingdom. And that's what we are in the church. Is that not neat, how God understood that and put it all together? Um, let's, since we're in Galatians, let's look at, well, I got out of Galatians, but since we're there, uh, let's look at some of these other passages. In, uh, uh, I guess we've already read 6 through 9, 13 through Let's read 28, uh, 28 and 29 of Galatians 3. He goes on to say, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I'm not going to read Ephesians 2 because it says basically the same thing. But yes, I am. We've got to read it because I know you. you won't, you'll go home and you won't read it. So let's read Ephesians 2. I mean, we're here to study the Word of God, not just to talk about it. So let's look at Ephesians 2. Um, I'm just going to hit on a couple points. Let's start with verse 14. For Christ himself is our peace, who made both groups into one. Who are the both groups? The Jews and the Gentiles. And broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, which is the law, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that he himself might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both into one body to God through the cross by it having put to death enmity. And then he goes on to say in chapter 3, verses 4 to 6, and by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into this mystery of Christ. Here we have another mystery. Lots of mysteries in the New Testament that uh, help us, that are explained in the New Testament that help us understand the old. And the mystery, which is other generations were not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Verse 6. To be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promises in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So we Gentiles are not just grafted in. We are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promises of Christ. That's the church because the Jews rejected the Messiah. So we have the church age. That's where we are today. We're in this church age. Now, a lot of people believe that we as the church have uh, not just been grafted in, but we have, since Israel rejected the Messiah, we now have taken over. We have replaced the Jews in all the promises. Based on what we've looked at in Scripture tonight, is that possible? No, it's not. We haven't replaced them because if we've replaced them, then the future promises aren't for Israel. The future promises are for the church. And the Bible never says that. Interesting, isn't it? Now, here's a thought for you. If we're grafted into the promises of Christ and, we're, and we are one body with the Jews, then doesn't that mean, I mean, can't you say to some extent that we've replaced the Jews? because we have this new thing called the church that's replaced Israel because the Jews and the Gentiles are grafted in together in one body. I mean, that's what it says. We're one body. So can't you make an argument from that that the church now has superseded Israel, you might say? 
Okay, I'm seeing your head. She say, no, why not? Tell me, explain to me why not. Because logic dictates, and this is what replacement theologists think, that we, that we have. Because it just makes sense. We're grafted, they, they rejected, we're grafted in, but the key is we're one body now. You don't separate. When husband and wife come together as one body, you can't separate them. You're not supposed to. And that's the same thing with the body of Christ. You don't separate the body of Christ. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to close this discussion with a very simple explanation of the parentheses. All this information that you've shared is awesome, and it all matches up with this, and it's right on. That's it. Those are the answers. Let me give you another thought. If we're together as one body, and the church is a parentheses between Israel past and Israel future, uh, there's a conflict there, because you, ha you don't have one body, then you still have two bodies. Israel past, Israel future, and church now. That's a little confusing. You know what the common denominator is, and that is something that we have to keep in mind here, and, and this lady over here brought it up earlier tonight. And that is, Israel is a people, Israel is a land, Israel is a religion. We gotta, get, we gotta be careful about this. God made his covenants with the Jewish people. God's future is for the Jewish people. The church are the born again believers in Jesus Christ. Do you see the difference? Anybody who believes in the Messiah, Jew or Gentile, is grafted in together into one body, and that's the church. Okay? That's the church. It can be Jews, it can be Gentiles. You still, however, until the end of the tribulation period, you still have the nation of Israel in the past. You still have the nation of Israel in the present, the people of Israel. You still have the people of Israel in the future who have not believed in the Messiah. So we're talking about physical Israel versus spiritual Israel. That's the key to that, and that's the key to the church. The church age that we're in today are those people, Jews and Gentiles, who have believed in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. That is different from the Jewish people of the Old Testament and the Jewish people of the future, who God loves, who God has a plan for, who God will fulfill his prophecies for, even though some did receive Christ and some haven't received Christ. So we're talking about the nation of Israel versus the believers in Jesus Christ. And those are separate entities. Those aren't one body. That means that the body of Christ, the church, the spiritual body of Christ through Jesus Christ and his blood and his belief in him, we are parentheses between what God did with the Jews in the Old Testament and what he's going to do in the New Testament. Now, does that make sense? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting because, um, so we have now in our timeline, we have the Old Testament. Now we have this church age that we're in now. And one of the things I said to you is God's got a plan for Israel, but first, before the future of Israel can happen, the church age has to happen. And that's the age that we're in today. So looking again... At this chart, we are in the church age. This is the group of people, Catholics and Methodists and Protestants and Jews and Muslims, I mean, background, Arab background, I should say, not Muslim, uh, Jewish background, not Jews who believe uh, that, they're, that Christ is not the Messiah. All ethnic backgrounds. Anybody who has believed on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is today in the church age. It's the church started after uh, Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and the church will continue until the tribulation starts, or if you're pre-trib rapturist, until the rapture takes place. That's the church age. But then the church has to be taken out before God works on the Jews and the non-believers in the tribulation period. And that's a period of time that we call the rapture. Okay, Armageddon, I'll just tell you and we'll deal with it later. But where it says second coming of Christ and the arrow points down, that's where Armageddon takes place. And we'll talk about that with judgments in the, the last couple of classes. So now, if you look at this timeline going systematically, after the church age, you have what's called the rapture of the church. Let's talk about it for a minute. You can see the line pointing up and the yellow markings that say the rapture. 
let's read the passage uh, that you did for your homework. This is one of the passages I gave you that we will look at tonight. This is the main passage for the rapture in Scripture from 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. It says, uh, now there's other passages in front of it that kind of explain this, but the context here is, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Now, based on that, where is Christ right now? In heaven. Do we know that elsewhere from Scripture? Yeah, we talked about it last week. Acts chapter 1 tells us that that's where he is. Matthew 24, Revelation 19 say he's coming back from heaven. That's where he is now. Here he's going to descend from heaven. There's going to be a shout, voice of the archangel, trump of God. We're not going to explain all that now. Just some of the things that are going to happen when it happens. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, at this particular time, there's a first group of people that are dead. But they're not just dead. They have a specific tag attached to them. And what is that? In Christ. What does in Christ mean? Saved. Just to simply, they have believed in Jesus Christ. They have died physically, but they have believed in Jesus Christ spiritually. First, the dead ones who are in Christ. Now, if you think about it, Specifically, who are the dead in Christ? I mean, they're the people who've died believing in Christ, but time-wise, who are they? I mean, when, when did they, what group of people are we talking about? Okay, anybody from, from the time of Christ, because it doesn't say Messiah here, it's specifically, well, Christ is Messiah, but the idea here is specifically those who believe in Jesus Christ, so the idea here is a New Testament church kind of an idea. We're not talking about Old Testament believers here, I don't think. Uh, we'll talk about those on our last night together. But we're talking about the time of Christ, from the time Christ died and was resurrected from the dead. We're talking about that group of people who believed in him as the Messiah up until this point. Those who are dead in Christ shall rise first. Now what's going to rise? Their bodies. Where are their souls right now? The souls are already with Christ. Paul said in uh, Philippians 1, 22 to 24, to live as Christ and to die as gain. Because if we died, he was going to go be with Christ. And then in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, maybe it's chapter 3. Let me look. Um, again, we'll talk about this another time. But 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 8 says, be of good courage, I would, rather pref I would prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. That's Paul speaking in 2 Corinthians 5, 8. So when, he, when people die having a relationship with Jesus Christ, their souls go to be with Jesus, but their body goes in the grave. So we're not talking about the souls here. We're talking about their bodies are going to rise first. Okay? That's the first thing. Then, after that has happened, we who are alive and remain, and that could be us right now, anytime, we who have believed in Jesus Christ, if you follow the context in here, who are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them, it says, to meet uh, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And there we will always be. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So the first group of people that go up are going to have their dead bodies raised to meet their spirits. And then there's us. Are our dead bodies going to go up to meet the Lord? Uh-uh. We're going to be caught up. We're going to be caught up body and soul because we haven't died yet. If the rapture takes place today, we haven't died yet. So we don't have to die physically. We get to go up body and soul to meet the Lord in the air. That's what's called the rapture. Now, it sounds a little strange, but let's look at where it comes from. It comes from the word caught up. Remember I just read back here? We will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air about halfway through that. Well, the word caught up means to snatch, to seize with force. In the Greek, it's harpazo. The word rapture is never in the Bible, but it is in the, Greek, in the Latin Vulgate, which is the Latin rendering of the Bible. And you get rapirmer in the Latin Vulgate, which means to carry off. And it comes from the word rapio. That's where we get the word rapture. Somebody tagged the word rapture to this event that will take place out of 1 Thessalonians, even though it's not mentioned in the Bible. What it means is simply a catching up. 
those people who are already dead will be resurrected, body and soul. The soul is already there to meet Christ in the air. We who are alive and remain will be caught up, body and soul, to meet Christ in the air. In other words, we are taken out of this earth to meet Christ in the air. Now what's interesting is, is there, do we ever see any place else in scripture where there's a rapture? Besides this. Enoch. Enoch. Okay, in Genesis, Enoch was taken up into heaven, captured up into heaven. Elijah, Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind of fire, chariots of fire. Philip, okay, what did Philip do? Okay, he, after he saved and baptized, was impossible sharing the gospel and baptized the Ethiopian. God caught him up and took him somewhere else. Okay, anything else? John, John, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, said John was caught up into the heavens. And speaking of being caught up into heavens, who was caught up into the third heaven? Paul was caught up into the third heaven. Same word, harpazo, caught up, raptured. Here you go. These are the raptures mentioned in scripture that you just said. Add to it Jesus. Jesus in Revelation uh, 12, 5 talks about him being caught up to God. Uh, and of course, his ascension is being caught up. The two witnesses in Revelation 11, after they've died and sat in the, their bodies are sat in the streets, they came alive and were caught up into heaven. The Bible talks about the rapture eight times, two, four, six, eight times, besides the one we're going to experience. So it is not that crazy of an idea. So the rapture is not so unique. The only thing about the rapture that's unique is when is it going to take place and why? I mean, basically the when. Um, now, there's another passage in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection passage. This explains all about the resurrection and the question you were asking about new, new bodies and, and things, Paula. Uh, it's, you can read it in 15, but here it says, I say to you, brethren, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit imperishable. That's why we have to be caught up, body and soul, because we need new bodies, resurrected bodies. But he says here, behold, Paul again is saying, I tell you a, another mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trump will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. So when this rapture happens, it's going to be like that. At the blinking of an eye, I mean just millions of millions of millions of a second, it's going to be over. And it could happen at any time because there's no prophecy that has to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church takes place. None. Now the rest of that passage goes on to say, um, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the victory and the reason for salvation. And I love the last verse, therefore... Because we have this hope in the resurrection. My beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. And that's a great place to end tonight. I'd like to go on. Uh, I will go on and I'm going to come back to this. But um, there are really four productive belief systems about when the rapture takes place either before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation, or what's called the pre-wrath. And the pre-wrath is a discussion about when the actual wrath of God starts during the tribulation period, and that's rather confusing. The three primary ones are the pre, the mid, and the post. And I believe the pre-tribulation, you have a handout tonight that gives you two different things. On one side are verses for the pre-tribulation belief, the mid-tribulation, and the post-tribulation. Now, I wish I could go through them verse by verse because I will explain to you why they mean what they mean. Uh, but I can't because we don't have time and that's not the purpose of this class. But be careful when you read them because the verses in the post-tribulation all look at, on the surface like the rapture will take place at the end of the tribulation period. But you have to take them in context and you have to understand what's being said to understand them. Also, along with that, uh, you have uh, all of these. The pre-tribulation belief or the, the uh, rapture on the left, the post-tribulation or the glorious appearing on the right. I've given you that chart for you to read yourself because there's 
two completely different reasons for the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. So if the rapture takes place when Christ is returning to earth, this is what's going to happen when he returns to earth, and there's two different positions. So I've given you lots of stuff. I encourage you to read it on your own, study it on your own. The timing of the rapture, here's more information on that, is not nearly as important as the belief and understanding of the rapture and when it's going to take place. However, my number one premise, I've got a, all those verses and more as to why I believe the rapture is going to take place at the beginning of the tribulation. But my number one belief system is the church is a parenthesis between God working on Israel in the Old Testament and God working on Israel in the future. And if the church, the believers in Jesus Christ are parentheses, and if, and it is true according to Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and the church is in Christ Jesus, and there's no condemnation for us, there's no reason for God to take us through the tribulation period. And there's no reason for God to raise up 144,000 Jews to proselytize in the tribulation period if the church is going to be there. So I believe God's going to take the parentheses church out of the way so he can go from Old Testament working with the Jews to the New Testament working, uh, excuse me, to the tribulation period and the new millennium working with the Jews. So we have... Before the Jews can experience that glorious millennial kingdom, they have to deal with the church age, which we're in now. They also have to deal with the great tribulation. And that's the focus of next week's class, is getting into the great tribulation and understanding even better the church's the parentheses, because our, your homework for next week is um, much of what it was last week, uh, Daniel 9 and Revelation 6 through 9. Because Daniel 9 is going to show you that God spent 69 weeks back here working with the Jews. And God has seven, excuse me, 483 years is the best way to say it, back here working with the Jews on some, some specific stuff. And he's got seven years in the future working with the Jews on some specific stuff. And in the meantime is the parentheses, the church. And you're going to see that in Daniel 9 and then getting into the book of Revelation. Thank you for joining us today on Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank. Living Word Ministries is a listener-supported program. To contact Debbie Blank, you may do so at livingwordministry.org. That's www.livingwordministry.org. Please tune in each week at the same time for Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank.